Got to wait for the stream. Okay, cool. Uh, welcome, good morning, almost afternoon here. Uh, we're going to be exploring the secret, the history of encryption algorithms and specifically how they're applicable in times of war. And if you're someone who likes to look at the slides as the talk is going, uh, I did tweet them out five minutes ago. Um, my handle is just Amanda Sopkin or uh, the FSF is also going to be distributing slides later on. So when you think of warfare, the first thing you probably think of is war in a physical sense, uh, meaning you have a group of people on some type of battlefield trying to kill each other with guns and bombs and all kinds of other horrifying things. Um, but usually there's another type of war going on in the background, which is more of an intellectual kind of warfare, as two different enemies try to figure out exactly what encryption scheme one side is using or how to bypass their radar technology, things like that. Um, so that's the kind of warfare that we're going to be focused on specifically today. Uh, and we're going to be looking at the encryption kind of warfare that I talked about as two different parties try to figure out exactly what the other side is using to encode their messages. Um, because obviously that's a huge advantage if you can read your enemy's messages in war. Uh, so I want to give a brief disclaimer before we get going. Uh, this talk is not intended to show you the latest and greatest in encryption technology. It's more of an exploration of the different techniques of encryption that have been used throughout history and some of the lessons that we can learn through the application of those methodologies. Uh, so to start out, I'm going to give you a brief overview of some of the terms that we'll be using, and then we'll dive right in, starting with the history of the Caesar cipher and coming all the way up to modern algorithms for encryption. And then hopefully we'll learn some fun things. There are some interesting stories and valuable lessons along the way. Uh, so if you Google cryptography, the first definition that you get is the art of writing or solving codes. And if you're like most people here, I'm guessing this is unsatisfactory because that applies to a lot of different jobs that don't involve cryptography. Uh, writing or solving codes is really very vague. Um, so there is a better, more specific definition provided by IEEE, which is cryptography is the method of storing and transmitting data in a particular form so that only those for whom it is intended can read and process it. So if you think of the base human impulse, I want to send a letter to my friend, and if my enemy intercepts it along the way, I don't want them to be able to read whatever I'm saying. So only the intended party should be able to receive it. Uh, and I want to start with a comic. This is from XKCD. The presenter is introducing their crypto system, and they say it's like any Feistel cipher, except in the S boxes, we simply take the bit string down, flip it, and reverse it. Uh, and the caption is, I've been barred from speaking at any major cryptography conferences ever since it became clear that all of my algorithms were just thinly disguised Missy Elliott songs. Um, so obviously this is a joke, but as you'll see with some of the encryption algorithms that we'll talk about, uh, often it has, does just kind of look like taking these bits here, putting them here, flipping them around. So I want to start out by introducing some helpful terminology so that we'll have a shared vocabulary as we go through the rest of this talk. The definition of encryption is an encoding using a key and an encryption algorithm. Um, so pretty basic. The important part of this definition is that it's only considered encryption if there is some type of key in play. Key derivation is the process for creating suitable keys for use in encryption, uh, often involving some element of randomness or entropy here. Plain text is input in its unencrypted natural form, um, so that can look like text itself, like a string, or it can look like a bitmap. It can really be any type of undisguised input. Uh, ciphertext is the input after it's been encrypted, so if you decipher something, you're unapplying the cipher so that you can perceive whatever it is. Um, the basic process here for symmetric encryption is that you've got your plain text, you apply some type of algorithm and a key to it to get your ciphertext, and then in symmetric encryption, you use the same key to get back to the original starting point. And ciphers are just a method for disguising text, pretty basic. So without further ado, we'll get right into the history here. Um, so the first popularly recognized example of cryptography is usually considered to be hieroglyphics. Um, in particular, there was one hieroglyphic artist named Namahotep II who would apply a particular kind of slant to the characters that he was writing. Uh, and he did this in order to try and make them look more sophisticated, kind of like 10 years ago, how you might use cursive if you wanted to impress people. 
Um, and it's not encryption in a true sense for two reasons. First of all, because he didn't mean to obfuscate the meaning of what he was writing. Uh, and second of all, because there's no key involved here. But it is one of the first examples they can find of someone applying a transformation to some kind of text in order to alter the meaning slightly. Uh, so fast forward a little bit, we get a more standard example of encryption in 100 BC uh, when Julius Caesar invented what we call the Caesar cipher. Caesar cipher is pretty basic. It's a substitution cipher where you substitute every letter in your unencoded text with a part of the alphabet that's been shifted over a certain amount. And in this case, the key is just however much you're shifting by. Um, so in the classic example, it's a shift of three characters. So you'd replace the letter A with the letter D, the letter B with the letter E, and so on and so forth. And uh, we get the documentation from the Caesar cipher from the letters that he would write documenting this process, which are written about by uh, Suetonius in the 12 Caesars. Uh, and it's also theorized that he designed more complicated or different systems of encryption. But the one that we usually talk about with Caesar is the Caesar cipher. And it's the basis for a lot of other ciphers that came after it as well. So how effective was the Caesar cipher? Fairly effective. I'm going to be using this somewhat arbitrary way of grading these encryption schemes throughout history. I'm going to give this one three out of five locks. And it's got a couple of advantages that made its work a lot easier. Um, in particular, many of Caesar's enemies were illiterate. So <laughs> that's kind of a big roadblock, makes it a lot easier to design a good encryption scheme if your enemies cannot read. Uh, and then because this idea was so novel, even if they could read, if they saw an encrypted message, they would probably assume it was written in a different language. Um, so those are kind of two big things that really helped the Caesar cipher out. But it did take a long time. It was in use for almost a century. Um, the earliest record that we have of someone being able to break it effectively is in the ninth century when an Arab mathematician named Al-Kindi uh, gives us our earliest examples of what's called frequency analysis. So I'm going to talk about how that works next. Um, so the idea with frequency analysis is that you can use it to break any substitution cipher where you're substituting one character for another one. And if you had encoded text that looks something like this, you could go through and count the number of times that each letter appears. And if I did that, I could get a table that looks something like this, and I could sort it so that the most frequently appearing letters come first. So in this case, that's the letter S and the letter O. And if I made a graph of that, you can see here it's a little more obvious. The letter O and the letter S are the most commonly used letters. And then I could graph the standard frequencies of letters in the English language. And here, the two most commonly used ones are the letter E followed by the letter T. Uh, and again, the most frequently used letters in our cipher are the letter S and the letter O. So based on that, I can guess that it might be a good idea to substitute E and T for S and O in my encoded text. And if I do that, I see a bunch of instances of the subsequence TLE, which in English looks a lot like the word the. So then I can guess that it might be a good idea to substitute the letter H for the letter L. And then I see I've got something that looks a lot like the word two. And if I look at my frequency analysis chart, that does seem to line up. So I can substitute O for the letter G. Uh, so I make some substitutions here. Then I see a word that looks a lot like one. So I can substitute an N for an F. SODVE looks a lot like solve, so that's another piece. Uh, so I make some more substitutions here. This word looks a lot like the word enough. Um, nount looks a lot like count, and so on and so forth, until eventually we arrive at an unencoded version of our original text. And it's important to say that you might have to, in practice, like, reverse some of these steps if you try a substitution and then it doesn't work out. But it is a pretty effective way of solving a cipher. Um, and you can see how with a computer it'd be even easier. So fast forward again throughout history, uh, we get our next big landmark in encryption history with a French diplomat slash spy named Blaise Vignier who gave us Vignier system. And this is a polyalphabetic cipher. Um, and it kind of relies on the Caesar cipher. So if you can imagine a table where you've got the alphabet along the left and then along uh, the top as well, what you get are a series of rows that look like Caesar cipher alphabets with one shift applied. So the first row has no shift applied, and then in the second row we've shifted everything over by one, and then two, and so on and so forth, all the way to the end. And the way that Vignier system works is you have a key, which you write out several times, and then at every character of your unencoded text, 
You look at the character of the key and use that to look up the character that you're going to use in your encoded text. So to give you an example, um, let's say I've got a super secure message and the key I decide to use is sup. Not a great key, but that's all right for this example. Um, so this first character in my unencoded text is H and the key is S. So if I look up in my table, the encrypted letter I want to use is the letter Z. Um, and I'd go through and replace all of the letters in the same fashion. So how effective was Vignier's system? Um, again, pretty, pretty effective. I'm gonna give it three out of five locks. Um, it was called, and I really don't have any kind of French accent, uh, but it's called Le Chiffre Indecipherable or something like that, uh, which means the indecipherable cipher until the year 1863. But in practice, they think that people who were good at crypto analysis could probably solve it as early as the 16th century. So how did they go about breaking it? Uh, they use something called the Kasiski examination, which takes, the advantage, which takes advantage of the fact that repeated words are, by chance, sometimes going to be encrypted using the same key letters. So for example, if my key is A, B, C, D, and I've got a string that looks like this with the word crypto, it's going to look the same when I encode it just by chance of how the key lines up. And if I look at the distance between these two repeated subsequences, I get 16 characters. Uh, so the key realization that Kasiski made was that you, that you could use this difference between the repeated subsequences to find the length of the key. So specifically, it'd be one of the factors of that distance. So in this case, the distance is 16 characters. So that could tell me that it's either 1, 2, 4, 8, or 16. And I could eliminate 1 and 2 off the bat since they're too short to be a useful key. And then that greatly shortens the pool of lengths that I have to work with. Uh, let's say I find out that it's an 8-digit key. Uh, so once the length that is known, if it's eight letters, for example, then I know that every eighth letter must have been encoded using the same letter of the text, which then I'm able to solve it using frequency analysis. Um, so I want to give a historical example of the Vignier system because it was used in the Civil War in the United States, uh, but not with a great deal of success because uh, essentially Confederate soldiers were using the Vignier system and the messages that they wrote were frequently intercepted and then broken by Union soldiers. And that's partly because the keys that they relied on, first of all, they repeated them a lot. Um, but second of all, they were kind of like catchphrases, like complete victory, Manchester bluff, and come retribution. So I think this is kind of a good tip. Um, generally in security, you don't want to use easy to guess phrases. Um, so maybe don't use like, our team's definitely gonna win in your key phrase. Uh, so this brings us to another important concept when it comes to encryption, which is that the secrecy of your system should rely, or the security, sorry, of your system should rely not on secrecy of the algorithm itself, but on secrecy of the key. Uh, and basically the idea is you should assume that the enemy is going to be able to figure out whatever algorithm you're using. And you can change out different keys, so you can rely upon the secrecy of that, but you shouldn't rely upon them not figuring out how your algorithm works. Cool, so now let's fast forward in history again and come to our first example of an electric mechanical form of encryption. And so that's gonna give us Hebern's system in the 1800s. Sorry about that. Um, and it looks something like this. So you've got an input like keys that you would type out and then a rotating cuff within which would spit out a particular in output. So it looks something like this behind the scenes where you've got your alphabet and then your rotating key which rotates after each input is processed. And in this case, the key to your algorithm is the initial setting of that rotating cuff. And if you knew how the machine was wired and you had that key, then you could decrypt the message. Uh, so once Hebert invented this system, a mathematician named William Friedman went up against this algorithm or this system to try and break it. And he was able to do so, it took some effort and some time, but he relied on a few different things. Um, so in order to break Hebern's system, he had some knowledge of how the rotating cuffs worked, and he realized that for every single rotor, if you had one step, that was equivalent to one key press. And then he also figured out that the fastest rotor was always at either end of the series. And he also used a statistical test, and I won't get into the details here, but basically through knowledge of how the mechanics worked, he was able to break this system so that he could decode messages pretty frequently. 
Um, and it's kind of, so what point one for William Friedman, uh, it's kind of an unfortunate story actually because Hebern developed this system and then started manufacturing it and tried to sell it to the United States Army. Um, and unbeknownst to him, William Friedman had already showed the United States Army how to break this algorithm, so they took a hard pass on the Hebern system. Um, and as a result, Hebern actually ended up in jail for defrauding his investors. Uh, so it's kind of unfortunate, I think, in an example of what can happen in if your encryption system doesn't really work out. So I'm going to give it two out of five locks. Uh, it is the basis for some of the mechanical methods that we'll see later on, but it didn't take terribly long before it was broken. So now we're going to get to uh, the Enigma machine, which came out towards the end of World War I and then was used throughout World War II. Uh, so similar idea to the Hebern machine, you've got your keyboard and then you've got a series of rotators and then it produces some output according to the wiring within. Um, so I'm going to start out by telling you about some of the breakthroughs uh, for work that was done to solve this machine by Polish mathematicians. Um, and at, at one point during World War II, they were kind of working on this problem full time. In particular, I'll talk about a mathematician named Marian Rajewski, who is working with other Polish mathematicians to crack this thing. Um, and I think it's impressive to point out that they didn't have access to one of these machines. All they had is they were able to intercept messages, encoded messages from the German army. And then using those, they were trying to figure out exactly how to come up, how to decode them and then be able to replicate that in the future. Cool, so he's gonna go up against the Enigma machine. So the first couple of insights that helped Rajewski out were that the single, there was a single initial six letter indicator that was used for all messages in a particular day. So you'd have a particular word like Khazar or something like that that they would use for all messages in that single day. Uh, and the chosen message key would be repeated in this enciphered setting. So to give you an example, um, the indicator, and my German is even worse than my French, but it's Grun, Grunstellung or something like that, uh, is the word for the indicator, and that is the initial rotor setting. So if you had an initial setting of the word letters R-A-O, and then a three-letter key, T-H-L, and then you enciphered them, you would get a six-letter indicator that looks something like this. So we're going to walk through an example here. Um, so in this particular indicator, the first letter in the sequence represents the fourth letter, and then the second represents the fifth, and so on and so forth. So by figuring that out, Rajewski was able to come up with a series of cycles. So let's say that the character A is four characters away from the letter N, and then we go to N, and we see that N is four characters away from P, P is four characters from L, and so on and so forth, until we get back to the beginning of the cycle. Um, so if we do that periodically, we end up with several different cycles, and Rajewski figured out that there would always be an equivalent cycle of the same length for each cycle. So in this case, there are three different cycle lengths, and there are two for each one. So you have two cycles of length nine, two of length three, and two of length one. And with this in mind, he figured out that you would have 27 possibilities for ciphers at the first and the fourth character. And that might not seem like a huge gain, but a lot of the work they were doing relied on kind of these observations and then factoring them out and putting all of that together. Another weak link that he was able to leverage is based on the fact that uh, the German army had several lazy cipher clerks. Um, so the cipher clerks were supposed to use a different indicator, a different three-letter setting every time that they were starting, but in practice they ended up using the same one. Um, so you're kind of bored, you're a cipher clerk, you're working all day, um, you don't really know if you're going to win the war, and you just keep using the same three characters like AAA or BBB, for example. Um, so that was also a key realization that helped them out. So basically, using a combination of different methods like this, uh, Rajewski was able to solve for the initial indicator of the day, and then factor out the board permutation for that day, and then he assumed that the Enigma machine they were using was the same as a commercial Enigma machine that they had access to, and using that, he was able to factor out the wiring for the rightmost rotor. Uh, and it turned out that none of this, this wasn't, he wasn't getting results that made any sense. Um, and he came to kind of a big revelation that the wiring was probably not the same as the commercially used Enigma machine. And then based on that, he made an educated guess that maybe it was an alphabetical ordering. Turns out it was. So then he was able to successfully factor out the rightmost rotor. Cool. So we've got this work that's been done by Polish mathematicians. We'll give him one point for that and zero points for the Enigma machine. And now we're going to get Alan Turing, which is probably a familiar name to you. 
Um, so Alan Turing is going to lead the British efforts to get the rest of the way to cracking the Enigma machine. And in order to do that, they put some pretty substantial computing power behind that, and they built this thing called the bomb machine based on the mathematical findings of this Polish group. Uh, so one bomb was designed to represent 36 enigmas internally, and I'm just gonna throw some numbers at you because it's pretty impressive. A single machine had 97,000 parts, was seven feet wide and six feet tall, 2,000 pounds, so two tons. Uh, in today's dollars, four million pounds, so I think 100,000 pounds was the equivalent back then, and I looked it up in today's terms. And 12 miles of wiring, whoa, sorry, 12 miles of wiring. Uh, so that's pretty crazy to think about. Um, Basically, the way it worked is that you would spit in the initial indicator for the day, the bomb would do its computation, do its thing, and then give you several possible answers. And then the code breakers would work through those to figure out what the actual answer was. And at its peak, it's estimated that there were about 200 of these machines across England, and they were cracking in total 3,000 messages every day. Uh, and it's estimated that in the course of World War II, they cracked 2.5 million messages uh, that they intercepted from the German army, which is huge. Um, so I'm not sure how they came up with this estimate, but they think that this shortened the war by an additional two years, which is a huge gain if you think about all the lives that would have been lost if the war had continued for another two years. So a huge victory for um, Alan Turing and the people that worked on this encryption monolith. Uh, so how effective was the Enigma machine uh, very effective, it's kind of uh, getting towards a more modern form of encryption where you really need substantial computing power in order to break it. Uh, so I'm gonna give it four out of five locks. Yeah, yeah, and the other thing is, um, this is bringing us to one of our pro tips, uh, it, the, part of the main failings of the Enigma machine uh, were the lack of process, so some of the human errors that we talked about before. So a good pro tip in security, it's important to have a process and try to eliminate possible sources of human error. Cool, so now at this point, the United States says this encryption thing is great, let's try and get some standards out here. So in 1973, IBM assembled a group to try and come up with a new encryption standard, which they eventually submitted to the National Institute of Standards and Technology. And that's where we get DES. And first, before I talk about all the drama there, I want to give a quick note on block cipher encryption. So up until this point, what we've talked about has been bitwise encryption, meaning you put one bit, like one character in, and then you get one bit out. Uh, now we're gonna start doing something different. Instead, you're going to, you have your plain text and you take a group of it, you take a block of bits, and then you use that to produce your cipher text. So it's much more computationally intense, and then as you could guess, also more secure. So now let's talk about DES. So I'm gonna go over this at a high level. Basically with DES, you put in some kind of input, and then it's, you apply an initial permutation to it to get it into a particular kind of format. You XOR it with the key that you've been given, and then you put it into a bunch of S boxes, which are substitution boxes. Basically, that just means that they're performing a series of substitutions, but not one-to-one. -one. As you'll see here, you put in 48 bits, and then you get 32 bits out in this example. Uh, and then you do another final permutation, and you spit that out. So another diagram of this, this is how the process works internally. You've got 16 different rounds, and it's being split up, so you're processing 32 bits here and 32 bits here. And this is what's known as the Feistel scheme. So there are two main criticisms of DES. The first one is that the key isn't particularly long. Uh, it's only 56 bits, so it's not very strong. Uh, and the second one was the S-box structure. So uh, before I tell you this, basically, the NSA collaborated with IBM to come up with DES, and after that happened, there were a series of hearings by the Senate to figure out whether that was appropriate or whether there had been undue influence on DES. Um, so this is a quote. Uh, the NSA worked closely with, the IBM, with IBM to strengthen the algorithm against all except brute force attacks and to strengthen substitution tables called S-boxes. Conversely, the NSA tried to convince IBM to reduce the length of the key from 64 to 48 bits, and then they compromised on a 56-bit key. So if it seems sketchy to you that the NSA was trying to convince IBM to use a less secure key, that's probably because it is sketchy. Um, but the other aspect of this is that they thought maybe the NSA had put a backdoor into the S-boxes of the algorithm. 
So this is a quote from one of the designers of DES. Uh, he said, we sent the S boxes off to Washington. They came back and they were all different. Also sounds pretty sketchy. Um, in this case, it turns out that uh, the NSA actually had improved the structure of the S boxes. So 20 years of crypto analytics later, they figured out that the modifications that the NSA made actually made it more secure than the initial setting. Um, so this is a quote from Bruce Schneier. It took the academic community two decades to figure out that the NSA tweaks actually did improve the security of DES. Um, so it turns out that that piece of it wasn't sketchy, but that doesn't mean that there were sketchy things going on here. So how effective was DES? I'm going to give it three out of five locks here, mainly because the key size isn't long enough to be secure. That's really its main shortcoming. Um, so I'm going to go back and talk about some interesting things that happened with free software in the 90s. Um, but before I do that, I want to briefly introduce the successor to DES, which is the Advanced Encryption Standard. Uh, so this came out of a contest as well in the year 2000. And I'm not going to go into the details here. This is a picture of one of the four stages uh, in a particular process that happens several different times. So it's also a block cipher algorithm. Um, so AES has a much stronger key length. It's 128 bits, and the key can be either 128, 192, or 256 bits. So that's kind of a big leap forward. Um, are there attacks on AES? Obviously, this is a huge area of research, and there are some attacks that have been documented, but so far, none of them are much better than brute force. Um, so I want to say that so far, they are not practical, but I want to highlight the key phrase there, which is so far. And I also want to point out that this isn't just true of AES. It's true of most good encryption algorithms that are using a key bit length of 256 bits or higher. Um, it's estimated that it would take longer than the universe has been around to crack an algorithm that's using a key length of 256 bits or longer. Um, so if you think of, for example, I'm not going to talk a lot about RSA, but that's often used to secure data transmissions. That's using a bit length of at least 1096 bits, so that maybe that helps you sleep a little bit easier at night. So how effective is AES? So far very effective, four out of five locks. It's not technically unbreakable, so that's why it doesn't get that fifth lock. So now I'm gonna go back and talk about the crypto wars. Um, so around the period of the Cold War, we get this period where the United States is trying to restrict the export of encryption algorithms. Um, because they want the power over those encryption algorithms, uh, which is not shocking. Um, and this is a t-shirt that came out of that era. It says, warning, this shirt is classified as a munition and may not be exported from the United States. And then it's got a description of the RSA algorithm. Uh, so this is kind of funny. Um, this didn't really work out. The United States wanted to restrict the export of key sizes so that you could only use 128-bit encryption in the USA. So as a result, when Netscape released its first web browser, they had to do two different versions. One, which was the secure version, with Chad 128-bit encryption. And that was something that United States citizens could use. And the other one was the international edition, which had 40-bit encryption. Um, but the problem was that it was a lot harder to get your hands on a license for the secure version. So as a result, most people ended up using the international version, which wasn't very secure. So it shows you the problem with that kind of thinking. Um, so in 1991, Senator Biden introduced a bill requiring providers of electronic communication to provide voice data and other content to the government when authorized by law. Obviously, this presents a lot of big privacy concerns. Um, so in 1991, we also get pretty good privacy by Phil Zimmerman. I'm going to talk a little bit about PGP. I'm not going to go into the details, but basically it relies on math that is very difficult to reverse. Uh, so the classic example is if you've got two really big prime numbers, if you know what those numbers are, then multiplying them is pretty easy. But if you've only got the result, then factoring out those two primes is very hard, computationally. Uh, so PGP relies on three different keys. You've got your public key, you've got a private key, and then you've got an encrypted key that you're sending along with the data. So I'm going to walk through what that looks like. Here's a diagram here. I'm sending some data along with an encrypted random key that you receive and then use to get the original message. So this process here is you generate a random key, you use that key to encrypt your data. I send you my public key, and then you use that to encrypt your random key, and then you send all of that to me, and then I use my private key to decrypt your random key, and then I use your random key to decrypt the data. Um, so that's kind of how that works. 
So uh, this was considered a threat to the United States. So they launched a criminal investigation against Phil Zimmerman and PGP. And um, in order to get around that, what he did is publish the source code for PGP by the MIT press. That's kind of a fun, I don't know, we're here at MIT. Um, so he published that by uh, the MIT press in order to allow the export of this technology under the First Amendment. So score one for Phil Zimmerman and PGP, score zero for the criminal investigation. Uh, so around this time period, we also get the end of the crypto wars. In 1996, Bill Clinton signed an executive order taking them off the munition list. Cool, so now I'm gonna give you a note on randomness and encryption, and then we're gonna go into some more interesting NSA drama. Um, so uh, if you think about why randomness is important when it comes to security, uh, I'll give you an example. If you're connecting to a Wi-Fi access point, your computer sends a random nonce to that access point. Uh, the access point recognizes it and then sends its own random nonce back, and then they continue their connection this way. And this is kind of the base idea for how other things work, like logging into Facebook or shopping online, for example. Um, and if you think about why randomness is important for this, then think about how it would look if you always sent one, two, three to connect to the access point. Um, that's very predictable and then also easy to get it in the middle of. So that's how randomness gives us that extra layer of security, particularly when it comes to picking a key. So I'm going to talk about an algorithm that the National Institute of Standards and Technology introduced in 2004. Uh, it's called the dual ECPRNG, which is uh, a mouthful, and it's a pseudo-random number generator. And there's a paper written about it, not going to get into the details. It involves elliptic geometry. Three years later, in August of 2007, uh, two Microsoft engineers, Daniel Chameau and Niels Ferguson, wrote a paper about a flaw in this uh, random number generator, which would allow for a backdoor attack. Uh, they presented this at a cryptography conference in Seattle, and it sort of made waves within the cryptography community, but not really more broadly than that. Three months later, Bruce Schneier puts an article into Wired magazine entitled, Did the NSA Put a Secret Backdoor in New Encryption Standard? Um, so you can see how this is starting to escalate. It goes from like, oh, there's this innocent flaw we found in this algorithm to we think the NSA put this here so that they can figure out the output of this algorithm every single time. Um, that has huge privacy implications. This would allow the NSA to determine the state of the random number generator and thereby eventually be able to read all data sent over the SSL connection. Uh, so you can see why this is of chief concern to the American people who do not want the government to have access to everything they're doing. Uh, so fast forward six years to 2013 with the release of the Snowden Papers, and this comes up again. Um, there, this program called Bull Run is referenced in the Snowden Papers, and in this article in the New York Times entitled, NSA Able to Foil Basic Safeguards of Privacy on Web, they write about this, and they say, one of the purposes of Bull Run is described as being to covertly introduce weaknesses into the encryption standards followed by hardware and software developers around the world. So we can see how this has escalated from a flaw in this algorithm to something that they think the NSA put there to something that is part of a larger plan to introduce systemic flaws into encryption standards everywhere. Uh, so getting more and more concerning here. And then later that year, the NIST finally recommended removal of the algorithm as a standard. So to go over this timeline again, uh, the algorithm was first introduced in 2004. Three years later, this conference, at this conference, they present the details of this back door to it. Uh, later that year, Bruce Schneier publishes about it in Wired Magazine. Uh, six years later, it comes up again with the release of the Snowden Papers. And then finally, later that year, there's a presidential advisory committee signed to examine this standard. And then it gets removed. So from the time that it was introduced to the time that it was removed, 10 years, an entire decade passed. Um, so the NIST has a list of all the different companies that were affected by this, and it's extremely extensive. You can look it up and just kind of keep scrolling. Um, it's essentially a who's who of companies in technology. Uh, you've got Microsoft and Google, you've got the RSA B-Safe libraries for Java and C++, and just more and more. Um, and if you think about the technology industry today, this kind of makes sense because it's like if Microsoft uses this algorithm in a particular library and then they put it in an API and then that API is used by other companies, all of a sudden this leaks everywhere. Um, so this is kind of the dangerous thing if you have a standard with a backdoor in it. 
Um, so don't assume that just because it's a standard that it's necessarily good. I mean, it's worth mentioning that at the time that this flaw was first pointed out, people kind of knew about it, so hopefully they weren't using it in key pieces of software, but hopefully is kind of the key word there. So where are we now? Um, I talked a little bit about modern encryption and how difficult it is to break something with a 256-bit or greater key. Uh, so does that mean that we're just kind of done here? Um, definitely not. What it means is that we're not exactly sure what's going to come next. Um, so it's also worth mentioning that in uh, the release of the Snowden papers, they did mention an attack that they're working on to try and break the advanced encryption standard. Um, so possibly that's underway, possibly they can do it already. Um, another tip that I want to point out uh, that we can kind of learn from some of these lessons throughout history is that often good security is not something that's flashy. Um, so it might seem like the thing that's going to protect you is using another 100 bits in your key, but often the things that protect you are just doing the basics that you should be doing, um, so your due diligence. Uh, so the common causes of breaches are often not encrypting everything that you should, using cloud storage without pre-encrypting, or using a poor random number generator. Uh, so this is a model of shared responsibility that's often used by cloud providers. And I wanna point out here that in the bubble that says responsible for security in the cloud, um, there are a lot of important things, like, so these are what the customer is responsible for. Customer data and the encryption of that, um, identity and access management, server-side encryption, and so on and so forth. Um, so in general, if you're using a cloud provider, unless you're using a free open source cloud provider, you're not exactly sure how they're going about encrypting your data, but in this case, they're also explicitly telling you that they're not doing it. Um, so that's an example of something that you're definitely responsible for if you're using a cloud provider. Cool, so now I wanna go ahead and wrap up, and I'm gonna give you three lessons that you can walk away with today um, if you're going to take anything away apart from like fun trivia that you can use at a party. Um, so good security is not obscurity. You shouldn't rely on the idea that someone will never figure out how your algorithm works because that's not going to be reliable. Um, having a process is essential. So a lot of the examples that we talked about ended up these systems ended up being broken because of poor process or human error along the way. Uh, and then trust no one, just kidding, kind of. Um, cool. So I'm not going to do an open Q&A, but if you do have things to say, I'm happy.